morning. So my name is Anthony Harris and I want to give you an example of operational research conducted within the national TB program in Malawi and show you how simple operational research can be and providing you ask the right question how important that research can be to influence policy and practice. So this is about recurrent tuberculosis within the Malawi National TB Control Program. A little bit of background. Malawi had a model DOTS program, management by district TB officers, a very good monitoring and evaluation system, using registers, using treatment cards, and using quarterly cohort reporting. About 27,000 TB cases registered per annum at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic, and an HIV prevalence in TB patients that was about 70%. Now this was the problem that we encountered and discussed around the table. Between 1987 to 1999, the proportion of patients registered nationally with relapse smear positive pulmonary tuberculosis had declined from about 6% to 3%. And during this 12 years, there had never been any reported cases of recurrent smear negative tuberculosis. By recurrent, we mean a second episode. However, HIV prevalence in TB patients in Malawi had increased during this 12 years from 30% to 70%. And there'd been a number of very good clinical research studies done in sub-Saharan Africa, showing strongly that recurrent tuberculosis increased as HIV prevalence increased. So this was a paradoxical situation where we should be expecting to see more recurrent tuberculosis, more relapsed tuberculosis, but we were seeing the converse, a decline. <clears throat> so we wondered whether under routine program conditions we were missing patients with recurrent tuberculosis. So the research question was very simple. <clears throat> have patients who have been registered as new tuberculosis been previously diagnosed and treated as relapse smear positive pulmonary TB and recurrent smear negative tuberculosis, i.e. is the program misclassifying patients? Now this was the method we adopted and this is the method we teach all our participants about in terms of designing an operational research study and an operational research protocol. First of all, what's the study design? Is it descriptive, case control or cohort? Second, what is the setting? What is the general setting in which we work and what is the setting of the study site? Who are the participants? We need to define them. What are the data variables to be collected? And here we can think about exposure and outcome variables. What is our data collection instrument? And can we validate any of that data? What are our sources of data? Are they registers, treatment cards, or are they electronic data files? Analysis and statistics, we need to spell out how we're going to do this. And finally, we of course, for all of this, need ethics approval. So to take that framework into this study on recurrent tuberculosis, let me take you through it. The design was a cross-sectional, prospective study involving a structured interview of patients registered as new tuberculosis. The setting, let me just read this to you. We would say something like Malawi is a small country in Africa with a high HIV and TB burden. There is a DOTS program and all patients spend the first two months of TB treatment in hospital receiving initial phase therapy. That is a very important bit of information to get over to people reading this protocol so they understand that many of our patients are captive in hospital for the first two months of their treatment. All hospitals in the country that register and treat patients with tuberculosis will be selected. This will be a national sample. And these hospitals include three central hospitals, 22 district hospitals, and 18 mission hospitals. 
and these hospitals will be visited between January and June 1999 as part of the routine national TB programme supervision. So in this setting and site visit description, I have spelt out where it is we're going to do the study and essentially how the TB programme works and why patients are remaining in hospital. Participants. <clears throat> All patients who are in hospital receiving treatment during the initial phase and who have been registered as new TB will be interviewed using a structured questionnaire. So is everyone clear about that? We're looking at new TB patients and we're trying to find out whether, in fact, they have had previous tuberculosis. The patients will be identified by going around the TB wards, all patients are admitted to TB wards, in a set fashion and will include all patients in their beds. If a patient is not in their beds, we are not going to go and try and look for them because we don't have the time. Variables, data collection and validation. So the variables to be collected include, very simply, the TB registration number, age, sex, type of TB, meaning is it smear positive pulmonary TB, is it smear negative pulmonary TB, or is it extra pulmonary TB? And we will ask them the simple question, have you or have you not had previous tuberculosis? And in those with a previous history of tuberculosis, we will ask when was it, what type of TB was it, and was the treatment completed? So if you're thinking here about exposure and outcome variables, the exposure variables are TB registration number, age, sex, type of TB, and the outcome variable, the one we are interested in, is previous history of tuberculosis. Data will be collected into a structured questionnaire, paper-based structured questionnaire, and we will try and validate the data on previous TB using TB identity cards whenever possible. So to explain this, when patients have TB, they are given an identity card. So their previous episode of TB will have been recorded on an identity card, saying who the patient was, what the registration number was, what the type of TB was, and was TB treatment completed. And of course, patients would need to have this on them when we do this structured questionnaire. Sources of data will be patients in their beds who will be interviewed, and any patients who are out of the TB ward and cannot be traced, of course, will not be included. Analysis and statistics. This is a national sample, so we're not going to calculate a sample size. We're doing the whole country. We will enter the data into EpiInfo software. We will use the chi-square test to compare differences in proportions between groups. And finally, differences at the 5% level, indicated by P less than 0.05, are regarded as significant. And finally, we obtain an ethics approval for this study from the Malawi National Health Science Research Committee. So what did we find? Altogether, we did a structured interview on 1,254 patients registered as new TB. And you can see that 94 of these patients said they had had a previous episode of TB, 8%. So they should not have been classified as having new tuberculosis. We have then stratified these 1,254 patients into who had smear positive pulmonary TB, smear negative pulmonary TB, and extra pulmonary TB. So you can see the numbers here, and on the right-hand column, the numbers and proportion who had previous TB. So 5% of patients with smear positive pulmonary TB had had previous tuberculosis. 14% of those with smear negative pulmonary TB had had previous TB, and 9% of those with extra pulmonary tuberculosis. We tried validating these previous episodes looking at patient identity cards, but only 9 out of those 94 previous episodes did the patient have an identity card. So basically most patients did not carry this with them, and this was not a good way of validating data. We did some very simple statistics. Let me read this to you. 
Compared to patients with smear-positive pulmonary TB, a previous episode of tuberculosis was significantly more common in patients with smear-negative PTB, and here the odds ratio was 3.5, with a 95% confidence interval of 2.1 to 5.7, highly significant. And also more common in patients with extra pulmonary TB, odds ratio 2.0, 95% confidence interval, 1.1 to 3.7, also significant. So how do we interpret this study? Well, first of all, patients then with relapsed TB and recurrent TB were being incorrectly registered under routine program settings as having new tuberculosis, and they were being registered as new patients. This was a mistake. This mistake was more common in patients with smear-negative pulmonary TB and also extrapulmonary tuberculosis. And the reasons for these mistakes were not identified. This was a very simple quantitative study and we didn't include a qualitative component to find out why mistakes were being made. So, a few questions. What type of study is this? It's a cross-sectional study with an analysis. What are the strengths of this study? Well, first of all, it's a full national sample, so very representative of what is happening in the country. Second, all patients identified with new TB were interviewed in the same way, so there was no sampling bias. A large number of patients were interviewed, over a thousand patients, and we had the same method for interviewing all patients. However, there are weaknesses. First of all, this was a questionnaire study, and we didn't ask why new patients had been misclassified. Secondly, we also didn't include demographic and clinical data on patients not in their beds. And we should have done this because we need to know that those patients in their beds were the same sort of patients in terms of age and sex and type of TB as those patients out of their beds, and we didn't do this. Very few previous episodes were validated as patients did not have previous TB identity cards. And finally, of course, when you work in the routine setting, patients with smear negative pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB may not actually have TB. Mistakes can be made in the routine setting. What happened next? <coughs> Well, the results and the implications of this incorrect recording were discussed with all the Malawi National TB Programme staff at the annual National TB Programme Seminar, which was held three months later. The central unit then prepared guidelines about how to diagnose and how to manage recurrent tuberculosis. And these guidelines were incorporated into a revised National TB Manual about one year later. Did this make any difference? So what we did a year later, we repeated the study, but focused just on those patients where big mistakes were being made, smear negative pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB. So we used the same methodology, went round the country and interviewed new patients with smear negative pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB to ask have you had previous tuberculosis? And what did we find? We find not perfection, but much better than previously. You can see out of the 214 patients with smear negative pulmonary TB, 5% now said they had had previous tuberculosis, compared with 14% the year before. And of those 213 patients with extra pulmonary TB, only two patients, 1%, had had previous TB compared with 9% the year before. So a big improvement on basically classification compared with 12 months previously. And how did this impact on our national TB control program? Well, our data became true and more accurate. You can see in those top first two rows, the proportion of patients with recurrent tuberculosis in 1998 and 1999 was 3%, 3%. We then have our interventions to improve the recording of TB cases. And if you look at those bottom four rows, you can see the year 
the total number of TB patients, the number with new TB, and the number and proportion with recurrent TB. And you can see that in 2000, immediately we go up to 8% of patients with recurrent tuberculosis. And gradually, over those four years, this proportion reaches 12%. And there it has plateaued. And it's probably an accurate representation of what is going on in Malawi. About 12% of all patients registered nationally have recurrent tuberculosis. So I think this shows you that very simple research asking a very simple question, collecting very simple data, can have a marked impact on how we, as a country in Malawi, report more accurately on our TB data. And of course, these TB data feed to the World Health Organization. It means their global TB reports are more ac accurate in turn. Thank you very much.